Good morning, everyone. My name is Jim McCracken. It's my pleasure to introduce today's UCLA Child and Adolescent Child Psychiatry Division Grand Rounds. Uh, we have a, a great um, set of speakers today uh, with uh, a presentation on uh, their fascinating and uh, latest research. Um, we're going to hear today from David Miklowitz, who is a distinguished professor, founder and director of the Max Gray Child and Adolescent Mood Disorders Program, and Patricia Walshaw, who is the co-director of the Max Gray CHAMP. Uh, David is a graduate of the UCLA uh, psychology program where he received his PhD, did his internship at uh, the NPI, and then wandered east to Colorado before seeing the light uh, when we were fortunate to bring him back to UCLA. Uh, he is a recipient of multiple awards. Um, most recently, uh, last year from the American College of Psychiatrists receiving the Bovis Award for Mood Disorders Research, a remarkable achievement for a psychologist. Um, in that society. He's well known for his uh, now decades long program in cutting edge family therapy research, which is increasingly translational as you'll see. He has many other talents as well, a bitching guitarist, and you might say unique vocal stylings. Uh, Patricia Walshaw is a pediatric neuropsychologist. Uh, she uh, originally was on the Pine Knob uh, pre-Olympic ski team before going to Temple University for her PhD with advisors Phil Kendall and Peter Weibrow uh, with a focus on bipolar disorder uh, from the very beginning. Uh, she did her internship here at, at Semmel and uh, uh, now has gone on to uh, co-direct CHAMP. Uh, she's a, a rather unique pediatric neuropsychologist, uh, quite comfortable uh, in many settings, giving the NEPSI, reading functional MRI scans and in the OR telling neurosurgeons where they can and can't cut, uh, as well as uh, barreling down uh, double black diamond slopes um, in addition. So uh, it's a real pleasure to hear from both of them about uh, uh, their most recent cutting edge research. Take it away, Dr. Miklowitz. Thank you, Jim. Thanks for a very nice introduction. We're both happy to be doing this. Um, let me put up our slides here. Uh, we're gonna, as it says here, we're gonna be talking about the CHAMP high risk trial, which is a, a study of children at risk for bipolar disorder. Um, We've been, uh, Patty and I and a group of us have been working on this study really for the last, oh, eight years, at least eight, nine years. It was a very long study to conduct, had a lot of different goals to it, but we're happy with the way it turned out and we're getting some new findings all the time. So I want to acquaint you with the background of the study and then kind of get into what did we find, what are its clinical implications and then turn it over to Patty, who's going to be talking about some neuro, neuro, uh, neuroimaging data we have from the CHAMP high risk trial, which is even more interesting in my opinion. So, uh, oh, and I'm supposed to say these slides will be available after the talk. I'm going to be showing you my disclosures in just a second. Um, and uh, I think that was it in terms of announcements, but um, I may be forgetting something. Anyway, let me... Uh, Move along. Uh, here's some my my uh, disclosures, mainly private foundations and NIMH and royalties from Guilford Press and John Wiley. And, and let me orient this talk by kind of giving you an idea of the the major hypotheses. We're interested in early onset bipolar disorder, as most people know from what Champ is and how it's affected by the family context. Um, we know that. Uh, we believe that family intervention initiated during childhood or adolescence 
can improve the long trajectory of not only kids at risk for bipolar disorder, but also kids at risk for psychosis and other conditions. So this FFT has sort of morphed into an early intervention. It used to be done entirely with adults. We also are hypothesizing that mediators of these treatments can be identified at both the behavioral and neural levels. In other words, what are the targets of these treatments, of this treatment, and what is actually changed in the individual who has high risk for bipolar disorder or bipolar disorder themselves? Um, many of you know what FFT is, and but just briefly, it is a time-limited Therapy. It's 12 sessions over four months involving the, the youngster and his or her parents. We begin with a, a very uh, detailed diagnostic assessment, usually the case ends PL, which uh, of course Patty has expertise in and uh, spends quite a bit of time training people on. But the treatment really consists of three component modules. One is psychoeducation. Think about that term psychoeducation. It's not just education, it's really a marriage between the words psychological or psychiatric and education. It's teaching families about bipolar disorder uh, or mood disorder its symptoms, its early recognition, its ideology, treatment, self-management, but also having this, doing this in a kind of Socratic way. We don't just give them facts we talk to them about what have they experienced, what do they know to have been the early warning signs or stressors that may have accompanied episodes, what can they do at home in addition to taking medications to try to keep them, the illness stable. Later on, we deal with high expressed emotion, the highly critical attitudes that we often see in parents of, of uh, psychiatric disordered kids. Through communication uh, training, we try to get them to rehearse effective speaking and listening strategies. Active listening is a good example, or making a request of change in another member of the family. And finally, we move on to problem solving towards the end of treatment when we're at sessions 9, 10, or 11, which involves identifying specific problems and teaching families a framework for solving them. So this is the basic structure. Many of you may recognize this as the structure for behavioral family therapy for schizophrenia, which in fact is where we got this treatment from, the original Ian Falloon, Bob Liberman approach to uh, schizophrenia. With that, we use a lot of handouts. Here's an example. We hand this to the family and say, here's what mania looks like. You know, your son has just gone through mania. Son, you're the expert in what it's like to be manic. <clears throat> Why don't you take a look at these symptoms and tell us which ones you had and then turn to the parents and say, how did those affect you? Uh, and what did you do to try to get him help? It tells us a lot about the illness history and also how family dynamics operate. We also get the kid to keep a, a mood chart. This is a simplified mood chart. It was developed by a 13 year old girl uh, in my Colorado lab years ago. Um, she described her mood states as varying from angry to super hyper. She didn't talk about it in terms of mania and depression. <clears throat> in this particular week, which was one of many weeks she plotted, she talked about feeling balanced and then getting angry and then uh, having a, a down mood for a couple of days and then becoming hyper energized later on uh, and the uh, the mood swings at least are correlated with arguing with her parents and in, in one case, partying and smoking weed. We don't know if those things are causative, but they're what the person does. And over weeks, you can kind of learn what's the role of stress, what's the role of uh, drug abuse, medication non-compliance in mood swings. We also track their sleep-wake cycles, as you can see below. Um, uh, in the communication training, we might teach them, say, a strategy like this. Make a positive request. Look at the person. Tell them what you'd like to do, how it would make you feel. Um, I'd really like you to talk to me in a different tone of voice. This, this uh, strategy, although it's, it sounds very simple on the surface, is a good way to get parents to be less critical. You can tell them, I understand you're angry. I understand you don't want him to do that anymore, but let's see if you can phrase it as a positive request. 
instead of don't talk to me like that, it's here's what I'd, ha I'd like you to talk to me in a kinder tone of voice. Um, and, and that would make me feel like I want to engage with you as an example of a positive request. We try to get them to practice this at home. <clears throat> a while back, a colleague of mine challenged me and said, let's see if you can summarize your entire career in one slide. And in fact, that's what this is. These are the results of 10 randomized trials we've conducted on FFT with medications. It's always done in conjunction with medication management for either adult or adolescent patients. We've had over a thousand patients in these trials, five trials with bipolar adults, two with bipolar adolescents, two with kids at risk for bipolar disorder. In fact, that's what we're gonna be talking about today. And one with transitional age youth who are at high risk for psychosis. And it's a, we're uh, in the process of doing a much larger study with Carrie Bearden's group on uh, high risk for psychosis, the, the so-called uplift study that's just gotten started. Generally, we compare these treatments to medication with brief psychoeducation or equally intensive individual therapy, which is what kids often would get in the community if they weren't in a randomized trial. And across studies, we found that FFT is associated with better benefits in over one to two years in mood stabilization, recurrence risk, and psychosocial function. In fact, we just did a meta-analysis of the entire uh, uh, for the 39 studies in the bipolar literature of psychotherapy. Uh, it was a complicated multi-analytic exercise, <clears throat> but in brief, one of the findings was that working with the family and teaching skills such as sleep-wake management or uh, communication training was more effective than any um, either than uh, those same strategies done at an individual level. So being in family uh, in family treatment or also in group treatment seems to work better than being an individual therapy for this disorder. I'll be happy to go into that later. But we have a good research background. Now, what do we mean by youth at high risk for bipolar disorder? There are, there's a lot of controversy about how that's defined, but generally we're talking about kids between the ages of nine and 17. We picked kids who have an antecedent risk condition that we believe could merge into bipolar disorder. And this of course mirrors some of uh, Mike Strober and Gay Carlson's work, as well as the Pittsburgh group led by Boris Birmaher. We know that a lifetime history of major depression or unspecified bipolar disorder, meaning these kinds of low level symptoms with short episodes that don't meet criteria for full mania, um, that kids who have those, uh, those disorders and have a family history of bipolar one or two are at very high risk for later developing a full bipolar one or two disorder. In fact, in the Pittsburgh group over an eight year period, they, they had conversion rates uh, uh, between 50 and 55%. They were able to, get, able to get quite a good prediction by combining these data with such things as the age of the relative when the relative first developed their illness. We also require that kids enter with active depressive and or hypomanic symptoms. Why? Because that's when the family is most motivated to get the kid help, either pharmacological help or psychotherapeutic help. Uh, so does adding FFT to whatever other treatment the kid is getting improve the symptomatic outcomes of kids at risk for bipolar disorder? That's really the guiding question of the high-risk study we're going to be talking to you about. This was a study we did first. There were two, two of these studies. First one was with Kiki Chang in, um, at uh, Stanford University. And we simply asked if you give symptomatic high-risk kids, uh, 12 weeks of FFT, how long does it take them to recover? So this was a short study. It was one year long. And sure enough, we found that those in FFT recovered more rapidly than those in a brief psychoeducation treatment, which we called enhanced care. So you can see there the FFT group uh, uh, stabilized in about 12 weeks versus about 21 weeks in the family treatment condition. 
If you look at the lower right, we're not going to talk about this a great deal, but this breaks the set samples into high EE and low EE. So is the family critical and hostile or protective versus more benign on those attributes? And the treatment really worked better if you had a high EE family. So having a high EE family is part of the personalized medicine involved in this treatment. We would aim at high, highly critical or conflictual families before we would aim at low key families. So that was helpful. So we decided to develop a second study with the help of NIMH funding. And that involved three, uh, three sites. We had 20, 127 kids. Once again, they had major depression or bipolar NOS and first or second degree relatives with bipolar disorder. I have to say, we've been very surprised at how ill these kids are, even though they don't meet criteria for bipolar disorder yet, or major, uh, or they do meet for major depression, but not bipolar. They've many oftentimes, oftentimes they've dropped out of school, done drugs, had early pregnancies, had suicide attempts. So these are not this, these are not innocent kids. They've had a lot of illness and often a lot of psychiatric contacts before. Our design was to compare 12 FFT sessions with six family and individual psychoeducation sessions. Uh, that was, it was sort of an expanded version of enhanced care. We wanted to give them a little bit more. So we gave them three family sessions followed by individual sessions for on a monthly basis. So both treatments lasted four months totally. We had standardized pharmacotherapy algorithms that one of the psychiatrists on the, on the study, Chris Schneck, designed. And they're very interesting. They involve decision trees about when you add, uh, when you add, say, lithium to a, uh, an antipsychotic, or in the rare case that you add an antidepressant, or uh, uh, when is uh, when is lamotrigine more uh, more effective than risperdone? These sorts of things are spelled out in in the algorithms. We followed them for up to four years, but the average kid we kept for about two years. Uh, many times, once they'd gone off to college, we couldn't get them any longer. Um, and the part that Patty will be talking about, there's uh, pre and post uh, neuroimaging, fMRI, DTI, and a number of other uh, uh, neuroimaging strategies that uh, helped us understand some of the mediating mechanisms of this treatment. Uh, the, here's a little bit about the sample. The kids were 13 between the ages of nine and 17, 65% were female. Uh, most 60% were major depression, split with four, about 40% with BP and OS. Lots of high EE families. Only about 25% of them entered on mood stabilizer or antipsychotics. And the biggest surprise to me was just how much anxiety comorbidity there was in the study. I uh, went in assuming it would be ADHD and more externalizing conduct disorder uh, uh, comorbidities, but actually anxiety and particularly GAD was very common in these kids. So the first question we wanted to ask is, could we prevent a recurrence? So these are kids who have, like I said, a major depression or bipolar NOS. They've never had a manic episode um, they may or may not have a depressive episode. And so we ask, once they recover from their initial symptoms, how long does it take before they have a recurrence? And this is the major finding, which is that on average, the kids in FFT um, had recurrences later than those in enhanced care by an average of between, uh, say, 63 weeks in enhanced care versus 81 weeks in family-focused therapy. That was a significant difference. May not sound like a lot. That's only, what, uh, 17, 18 weeks. Um, but nevertheless, for in the life of a family and a child, that can make a very big difference. And so on, on average, the kids in FFT lasted longer without having a mood episode. When we really dug into this, we found that the mood episodes were more often depressive episodes or perhaps mixed episodes than they were manic episodes. Manic episodes, true manic episodes were rare to see at follow-up, even though they were at high risk. So that's one finding. The second one, um, 
was we had an impact on suicidal ideation. Kids filled out the suicidal ideation questionnaire every four months. And uh, of course, a suicidal ideation questionnaire allows them to admit things they may not be readily willing to admit to their parents. You can see here there's an interaction between treatment and time with the kids in red, kids in FFT showing a bigger drop in scores that tends to be maintained for most of the follow-up. Actually, it was uh, what's not pictured here is the interaction, the fact that uh, the higher the suicidal ideation score, the more FFT was effective in bringing it down over time. And this also uh, carried over to suicide attempts. Although we didn't have a lot of suicide attempts in the study, I think we had 24 who went to the emergency room. Clearly, that they were less likely to have an, an attempt if they attended the FFT sessions. Now, you know that every talk by a psychologist has to have at least one of these slides with bubbles and arrows and beta weights and constructs and so on. But this is pretty straightforward. Basically, what we found is that improvement in suicidal ideation was mediated by whether the kid felt that family conflict had dropped during follow-up. So if, uh, so treatment uh, led to differential drops in family conflict using the conflict behavior questionnaire. And in turn, those changes predicted a reduction in suicidality. So, low, so a target clearly, if you want to prevent suicidal thinking or behavior is to work with the family on reduction in conflict, often through communication training and problem solving. There are also individual factors such as the uh, kid's baseline suicidal ideation score that was important here, but a lot of the variance was accounted for by family conflict. So what, what didn't we find in the same trial? Well, first, the FFT and the uh, six session EC didn't differ in conversions from major depression to bipolar one or two. We only had a 15% conversion rate, which is not so high in, two, in a two to four year study. It's a little lower than what Pittsburgh finds, but nevertheless, uh, it did not differ across groups. We did not find any differences between the two groups in medication regimens. So uh, they were treated with pretty much the same medications throughout follow-up. And this one was quite interesting to me. About a third of the kids are in recovery by three years and stay in recovery. So this is uh, some post hoc analyses that Mark Weintraub from our group did. He did a latent classification analysis and found that the kids really fell into three groups. One group was what we call pr predominantly symptomatic. That's the class three, the ones that basically rarely got into euthymia and in over 36 months were still symptomatic at the end. There was a group it always works out sort of one third, one third, one third when you do this kind of uh, analysis. But uh, we had a slightly uh, lower proportion of kids we called moderately symptomatic throughout. But the interesting group to me is class one, the group that's significantly improving. So that's about 40 out of 126 kids who over the course of treatment, not necessarily because of the FFT, stabilize fully by uh, three years and had, had you know, reasonably high uh, GAF scores and symptom scores and percentage of time euthymic. So it's not all bad news for these kids, although they may convert to bipolar disorder. There's a goodly number of them that will actually get better over time. And not all of these kids were even taking medications. This was also found by Boris Birmer and his group that this is not, <coughs> and some kids, they seem to do all okay with these these uh, uh, illnesses over time, which was a hopeful finding. And with that, I'd like to turn this over to Patty, who uh, really has been heading up the uh, uh, looking at corticolympic circuits in these, the same study. Um, so Patty, uh, I'm going to shut up now and um, let you take it. Okay. I think, um, yeah, good. Now I come on screen. Yay. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Patty. I uh, have no disclosures, just to announce. Um, I 
want to talk a little bit about the imaging findings that we have. We have um, all these wonderful uh, findings related to symptoms and suicidality and things like that, but we really wanted to look at how the brain responds to treatment, um, particularly in these high-risk kids. Um, we do know that bipolar disorder is linked to amygdala hyperactivity and prefrontal underactivity, so again, you have this um, disconnect between these um, frontal and limbic regions of the brain that are really responsible for emotional control, emotional processing. Um, and poor connectivity between these regions has been associated with greater severity of mania, longer duration illness of the of, um, bipolar disorder. Um, and so it's really uh, indicative of a, a more severe course of illness for bipolar disorder. I think what thing to highlight though is that, and that we often get lost in an imaging, I think is that we often are just looking at the patients, right? We think what's wrong with the patient's brain, things like that. One thing we found um, in our study of youth with bipolar disorder is that family chaos is also associated with greater connectivity at rest, right? So this is um, a factor that it's not just, these are all youth with bipolar disorder, but if you have a higher amount of chaos in the family, you actually have a greater amount of disconnectivity within your brain just at rest. Um, so it's, it's a family environment as well as a patient issue. And I think that's an important feature of this. Um, we know that brain networks that underlie emotional processing have been shown to change in response to treatment. That's not just in bipolar disorder, it's in other types of disorders as well. But one question we had was what about high risk youth? So next slide, David. All right, so when, when we took our high risk sample, um, we just wanted to look at some baseline function. And one thing we looked at was the white matter um, in the brains of these high risk youth. And one thing we noticed is that um, Cal scores, which is a measure of lability in a child. Um, if you have a, a higher Cal score, if you have a lower Cal score, it's, it's associated with increased FA or fractional anisotropy in the brain, right? And this is pretty much seen across the entire brain. So the entire corpus callosum, other large white matter tracts in the brain, um, these are things that are um, uh, responsible for passing a large amount of information around the brain, um, particularly things like the uncinate fibers that connect between temporal and frontal lobes. Um, these were things that were shown to be uh, related to how labile you are. Um, next slide, David. Can I add one thing, Patty? Yeah. The, so the, the cows is our measure of mood instability. It has such things as uh, my son or daughter starts crying for no reason or goes off and becomes extremely rageful when we can't predict. So it's a, uh, and in a couple of studies, it has been found to be predictive of conversion to bipolar disorder. So mood instability is an important construct in these kids. Absolutely, absolutely. So again, what we found really is these, um, lower FA and this lower fiber integrity, um, which means essentially your bandwidth is lower. Um, in these uncinate regions uh, is associated with this higher lability. Um, and again, is in implicating that there's poor connectivity between these frontal and limbic areas of the brain, uh, which are really important for affect regulation. Um, additionally, if, if you have this poor bandwidth across the brain in general, you're gonna have lower suboptimal connection speed for all information that's passed around the brain. So again, if you're more labile, you're having a harder time passing information around. Next slide. All right. So we did, um, a, we do know that, um, uh, you know, we're, we wanted to look at how uh, these networks for emotional processing change in response to treatment. So we did two different tasks um, to examine this. First task that we did is called our happy cafe task. It's a task where um, the, it's an implicit emotion task where individuals are looking at standard Ekman faces um, with happy, calm, or fearful expressions. And the idea is that they classify with a button press what the gender of the person is um, on the screen. And again, it doesn't really matter what they press, the implicit portion of the task which we're interested in is actually what emotion is being shown and what's happening in the brain when that emotion is shown. So we wanted to look at neural activation during these various emotions and see how it changes in, with respect to treatment um, in relation to different symptoms. So next slide. 
And turns out it does, this is good, right? So, um, and it does in the areas that we hoped it would. So um, what happens is, is that this is our first trial of youth with bi actual bipolar disorder. And we found that um, increasing dorsolateral prefrontal cortical activation over the course of treatment is, is correlated with increasing improvement in manic symptoms over time. So this is individuals who have, youth who have bipolar disorder. And again, in this prefrontal area. Next slide, David. Um, so we looked at in within high risk youth as well. And the good thing is we saw a very similar effect. We saw increases in dorsolateral prefrontal activation was, in, it was correlated with improvement in depressive symptoms and decreases in amygdala or limbic activation is uh, correlated with improvement in manic symptoms. So again, you're having this kind of reset a little bit of the brain where you have decreases in limbic activation, increases in frontal activation, you know, which is hopefully inciting a more regulatory emotion regulation uh, model for the brain. Next slide. Okay, so we looked at it also in respect with respect to the different treatment conditions. So we looked at differences between FFT and our enhanced care um, control condition, which showed that it's, if FFT is kind of carrying the load here. So people who are in FFT do show this increase in uh, dorsolateral prefrontal cortical activation and decreases in insular activation, another area associated with kind of limbic um, connections, connectivity between limbic and frontal regions of the brain, things like that. Next slide. All right, so our second task was a problem solving task, okay? This is a um, task that I created for this study specifically because while it's great that we have these tasks that you do that are kind of showing emotional faces and things like that, they have working memory tests, et cetera, nothing was really kind of capturing what we do in family therapy, right? So nothing's really capturing the actual ecological validity of what's happening for these kids and how they might respond to treatment. So we, de we designed this test to really look at that. It's based on a, a Johnson paper examining neural targets of self-reflection. Next slide. Um, you can click one more too, David. Okay. So basically what happened in this Johnson study is that um, they looked at self-reflection and this is in patients who have depression. Um, and when people do self-reflection tasks, but not during their cognitive distraction tasks, they activate, they tend to activate more of this medial prefrontal and posterior cingulate regions of the brain, indicating that these areas may be more um, corresponding to self-reflection in the brain. Next button press. <laughs> Um, and the medial prefrontal region may be associated with more self-reflection that involves more agency, next button press, whereas the posterior cingulate may be associated with self-reflection that involves more kind of an experiential response. Again, both targeting self-reflection, um, but different kind of aspects of self-reflection. I will note, however, that Self-reflection, while it's good, um, if you have too much self-reflection, for instance, when you're depressed, that's just basically rumination, right? You're having too much of this kind of self-machination of your own ideas and what you're thinking, right? But in people who are um, inherently more labile, it may be a good idea to have a little bit more self-reflection about what's going on and what's happening in the in, with respect to you and in the environment. So next slide. So we created this problem solving task where it's a very, um, it's a thought process task. It's not one we usually do in the scanner where you're pushing buttons and things like that. We're doing a lot of imagining in this task. So the situation is presented on the screen for 10 seconds. They read the situation and they're supposed to um, imagine it happening to them. So imagine what's happening to them. Then at, it'll say, what would you do about it, right? Um, and that they think about that for 12 and imagine what they would do about it for 12 seconds, okay? Notice we didn't say, how would you solve this problem? We just said, what would you do about it? Because part of it, we wanted to actually just allow for the fact that initially, hopefully, <laughs> we will have kids where, you know, you give them a problem and, you know, it's about your parents or something like that. And they say, I would just tell them to piss off and I would walk out the room and just shout at them and things like that, right? Not a great problem solving strategy, but we wanted to allow for that and allow for the fact that that might change over time with, with um, treatment. 
We have a jitter rest and a button press. That's really to just make sure they're still awake during this whole task. If you're actually asking people to imagine in the scanner, it's actually very easily to fall asleep. So we presented two types of problems in this task. We wanted to have, again, this kind of more ecologically valid um, uh, aspect to this task. So we have family problems, which is things like your parents want you to stop watching TV, but you don't want to, and neutral problems, like you can't find your shoes, right? What's really important about this task um, that's very interesting is that all the problems that were identified and presented were specific to that individual. This is kind of going, throwing caution to the wind of what we usually do in fMRI where we have this, everybody gets the same tasks. You look at accuracy across tasks and things like that between people. We wanted to make sure what was really important here was that the saliency of the problems was, was there for the patient. So we don't really wanna have people looking at problems that they're like, that doesn't happen in my family, right? So the individuals each filled out a questionnaire before the scan with a whole list of different problems that can happen in families. And we wanted them to just check yes or no if it was true for them. Then we took those problems and we actually created each person's own task with a set of problems that are relevant just for them. Um, again, increasing the saliency of the stimuli that are being presented. Because we're doing kind of within subject um, over time analysis, it doesn't really matter that these subjects have, this one has these problems and this one has these problems. What we're looking at is kind of saliency of things, these things and how they change over time. Okay, next slide. Okay, this is just to highlight that they, we separated the blocks of the scan if you're an FMI, fMRI person. Um, so that we analyzed um, the situation portion of the scan and the problem solving part of, part of the scan. So, okay, next slide. And what happened was very interesting. So we looked at this um, changes in this neural activation in relation to liability. So these CAL scores over time. And we found that improvement in liability was associated with increased activation only for the FFT group, so not for the EC group in these medial prefrontal areas, some of this more cortical areas, potentially involved in language and things like that, and more of this posterior precuneus, um, posterior cingulate areas of the brain. Um, some of it happened during family problem solving, some of it happened during the or same situation, some of it happened during the actual problem solving portion of the task. What's most important for this though, is that there were absolutely no findings on the neutral, neutral problems. So not for family FFT, not for EC, just that all of the meat and all of the changes were happening only in the relation to the family problems. So next slide. Okay, I actually, David, I have a summary that I can talk about. I don't think it made it into this slide deck, but <laughs> basically um, what I wanted to say was that um, the, the grand summary of all of this is that despite differences in tasks, what we're seeing is that high risk use showed improvement in emotional processing networks with treatment, right? So we're having this increase in the frontal activation, decreases in limbic activation, and it's specifically in response to FFT. And when you think about what this is, you know, FFT communication and problem solving skills, what we're doing in these um, tasks is we are, when we have these things happening in the brain um, and in therapy, we're really asking people to slow things down, right? So we're really asking them to um, slow down what they're doing. We're reining it in a bit, right? When I tell you to do some active listening, I'm gonna say, okay, I want you to listen to what this person is saying. And I want you to have to repeat back what they're saying now before you respond, right? So it's enabling you to um, have kind of a stop. You're en engaging more frontal systems in that task because what you want to do is just yell in, immediately at the person. That's what all family members want to do when we see them, right? You said this, I can't believe you said that. How would you accuse me? Blah, blah, blah. But if I'm asking you to, okay, what you said was that you feel that you're not being heard when I say these things and that I, you wish I would do this differently. Okay. And then they think of their response. It's an, it's, it, it's engaging a lot more of that frontal inhibition system um, that isn't maybe necessarily happening at a normal rate, especially for people who have more liability. And so we are seeing improvements in that um, over time. So. Thank you, Patty. That was really excellent. It made it really a lot more clear, including to me, 
which I didn't know before. Um, so we want to wrap up uh, first by showing you some clinical take homes of studies like this. What, what have we learned about the treatment of pediatric bipolar disorder and kids at risk for bipolar disorder? Uh, Jan, Scott, and I got together some years ago to come up with a list of what are the key features of psychological management of bipolar disorder. One, of course, is involving parents and siblings or a spouse if they're available in some or all of the sessions. That's, of course, what we're all about. Encouraging daily mood monitoring so the kid takes charge of are there highs and lows in mood over time and what triggers them. But really, the core is the so-called mood management plan, where we try to clarify the roles of both the patient and the family members. And first, how do you recognize early signs of new episodes? How do you manage stressors that may trigger symptoms? How do you use uh, stabilization of sleep-wake cycles as a way of preventing future episodes? And when do you go about contacting the physician for rescue meds? You don't do that every time the kid is having a prodromal symptom, otherwise the kid's gonna end up on a boatload of medications. Uh, but there should be that information ready at the go in order to uh, uh, prevent a more serious episode from occurring. So we try to get them to feel a sense of control uh, from, from being able to manage that. Of course, enhancing family communication training and problem solving from role playing. <clears throat> Patty mentioned how this might be relevant to neuroimaging as well. Teaching people how to talk and listen and be diplomatic and solve their problems in a, in a uh, uh, re respectful way rather than you did this, you did that. Encouraging re-entry into the school and social network uh, or, in, uh, or work uh, life. <clears throat> particularly for young adults. This is a very big issue. How do I get back to school, finish my degree? How do I get back to the job I had after this episode? Do I tell people about it? And in so doing, we end up addressing stigma, the uh, issue of families feeling like they've been singled out or they're tainted or their friend, uh, son's friends won't come over anymore. Um, these are all, this is all grist for the mill for psychotherapy. Not all this has to be done with a family. You can do the same thing with an individual or with a group. But remember our finding from the meta-analysis that working with a family or work, working with a group leads to better outcomes using these skills. Um, <coughs> in terms of future directions, we haven't completely sh uh, shown yet <coughs> Excuse me. Whoa, allergies. Thought I wasn't going to. Anyway, early intervention can bipolar disorder be prevented? Well, one thing we know is that clinical high risk phenotypes are becoming clearer. So now we can look at a kid and say, okay, there's mood instability, there's depression, there's these small hypomanic episodes, and there's a family history. As a kid, we have to be careful about just giving an antidepressant to because we might kick out, might kick off a more serious manic episode. We need to use an algorithm with those kids. We also need to give this, these interventions early enough and have clear targets. Families don't come in and saying, saying, I really am concerned about my son. I think he might be developing bipolar disorder. And I know what that is. More often they say he's not going to school. He doesn't attend. He blows up in various ways, he's making life miserable for his younger sister, fix him. Uh, that's that's the, the sort of uh, uh, way that you can in, engage people in early intervention. But they have to agree to the rationale for early intervention. This is going to help the kid develop a less severe mood disorder over time. And you have to follow the kids long enough to know whether they do actually convert to bipolar disorder. We only follow them for two years, which is not enough. Now, how can we bring FFT to scale? How, you know, so we've been doing all this work in multiple uh, laboratory settings, but is there a way in which you can uh, download or disseminate FFT within community mental health centers? We've done some work in that. One of the more promising aspects of it is our development of a mobile app. This was done in conjunction with Armin Aravian, who I think some of you know, who's over at the Center for Health Services and Society. He's developed 
the Chorus platform where you can build apps fairly easily. And uh, in our current studies, we've said, let's target a treatment consisting of FFT and a mobile app to a, a more broader population that we know is, is related to outcome and treatment response. One is having a parent with a bipolar or a unipolar depressive episode, uh, a disorder that broadens the sample somehow, somewhat. Having a parent with a high EE attitudes, because we know that they're, uh, these families are more likely to respond to FFT. And as Patty talked about, high levels of mood instability. That's, those are the targets we have for our current study of FFT in combination with a mobile app. Um, here's an example of what the mobile app is. So the kid sees this on a daily basis. There are reminders and they say, please rate your mood on a plus three to minus three scale. Um, you, you get interesting data from this alone, but they also can rate uh, how stressful has life been today? How critical has your mother and father been with, towards you today? How caring or warm have they been? So you kind of build in the, the, the patient's awareness of his or her surroundings. This is a typical um, uh, face page they'll see. They get an emoji if they have completed all these tasks, kind of like you do on Fitbit. But here are the, the tasks we ask, ask them to do. They have to do a weekly check-in where they report on their moods, fill out some questionnaires, talk about family functioning. We have them call in to a voice uh, journal, a voice server, which has a robo voice associated with it. it. says things like, please tell us how you are doing with your family, or please tell us how you are getting along with your friends. And they're just supposed to talk into this recorder for 30 uh, three minutes or four minutes. And then there's the skill portion. What can you actually do to practice the skills you're learning in sessions? What does the skill training look like? Well, we'll go to a page like this where active listening is uh, spelled out. Look at the speaker, attend to what's said, nod your head, ask clarifying questions, paraphrase, check out what you heard and instructions on, on how to do that. If they click the bottom line, they would see a video of myself and Sarah Marvin modeling this technique um, and asking them to kind of watch it and discuss it as a family. And you get some pretty interesting data. Here's an, uh, an example of a, a kid with bipolar NOS who was followed over a couple of weeks with this app. As you can see, uh, the kid was reporting hypomanias and depressions, uh, particularly uh, on January 1st and January 14th, January 17th, when he got down to a minus three. The parents had their own mood ratings, which didn't necessarily match on exactly to what the parent, the kid was saying. But what's interesting to me is the stress levels, the fact that the kid is reporting variable and sometimes quite high levels of stress throughout a two, three week period. A score of nine is pretty high for a, a stress rate. Or you could look at criticalness. How critical were your, were your parents? Well, on 1228, they were, were very critical. What happened on 1228? Do you want to talk about it? Do you want to problem solve? How your parents might have said those things to you more diplomatically or how you might have responded more diplomatically. So this Self-monitoring is also for the purposes of treatment plan. What do we have to go after? Is it criticism? Is it conflict? Or is it something more, right, more to do with, say, mood instability independently of family functioning? So I think we, uh, we uh, are right on time and we want to leave plenty of time for questions. If you do have a question, of course, you can write them into the chat function and we'll get to them one by one. Um, I do hope you do have questions, but let me also take a moment to thank many, many people who've worked on all these studies, not just ones at UCLA, but earlier in my work in Colorado. Um, some of these people you can recognize as people went off on their own. Uh, um, Alyssa Ellis, for example, um, or uh, uh, Barbara Dausch, who now works at the VA and, and uh, champions these treatments. Um, uh, uh, Tina Goldstein, who's at uh, Pittsburgh and has developed a DBT for bipolar disorder. 
I've had, of course, wonderful mentors, Mike Goldstein, Keith Nectarline, some of them are here. Um, uh, listed uh, Jim here as well, and Armin Arabian, um, and uh, funding from various uh, funding uh, organizations, NIMH, NARSAD, and private foundations. So with that, um, that kind of gives you an idea of where we are in our research, and we'll stop here and take some questions. Thank you. All right, David, so we have some questions in the Q&A. Um, I don't know if you want to open that up and people can feel free to put questions into the Q&A. Um, Mike has asked a, one, a number of wonderful questions as we knew he would. Um, so do you want to look at, do you want to answer the first question there in the Q&A? So it reads like this. First, as adverse life events are more likely to precede episodes of depression and episodes of mania, is the effect of FFT in preventing recurrences accounted for strongly by its, suppressive, its suppression of depressive episodes? Uh, and likewise, is the most common symptom over time in bipolar one is depression. Is the effect of FFT seen as a greater reduction in depressive symptoms? Is the positive effect of FFT on index remission mainly when the index episode is depression? It's an interesting um, uh, uh, point. And I would put it this way. Yes, the effect sizes for depression do seem to be higher in most FFT studies than they are in uh, than they, uh, than mania. But mania does play an interesting role. Uh, in our study of adolescents with bipolar disorder, we got nothing in the first year of the trial. We didn't see any differences in depression or mania between FFT and a control. But Starting in the beginning of the second year, we saw a much greater drop in mania scores in the FFT condition than in EC. So clearly FFT was having some impact on, on residual manic episodes. I don't know that we could say that it could prevent a manic episode, but they may help with lower level hypomanic symptoms that sometimes uh, merge into full depressive episodes. And certainly, Subset threshold depressive episodes is one of our targets. All right, it looks like he has another question about um, the suicidal ideation slide. Okay. What's that? I, I don't about, the slide, about the slide on suicidal ideation, given the positive effect of lithium on suicidal behavior in Kobe, was lithium therapy controlled for? In other words, was less suicidality associated with greater lithium dose, dose or exposure? This is going to surprise you, Mike, but there was exactly one patient in this study who was on lithium. Uh, it was used very sparingly by the docs. It's a little bit further down the algorithm than uh, risperidone, for example, uh, or Abilify. Uh, lithium is, of course, I, I'm a big fan of lithium. I think it has an anti-suicidal effect. Kids are afraid of lithium because of the weight gain, the acne, the the, um, uh, even just the association to lithium as the one that you take if you're crazy. Um, so it's a little harder to, uh, lithium is a bit of a harder sell for uh, younger people than it is for older people. But uh, I think there are a lot of kids who would benefit from it, but they weren't in the sample. All right, one more question. Um... In adult studies of bipolar one, there's evidence of recurrences of depression increasing in the third decade after a period of extended remission. What's your hunch as to what is this, what is this accounted? I wonder if this is seen in patients with ongoing familial stress or a history of family stress that leaves the brain sensitized. Would you recommend that patients with such history receive preventative periodic psychological family-based intervention? Uh, uh, meaning kids who have uh, difficult parenting backgrounds. Yeah, meaning that later on, if you've had this difficult parenting background or familial stress, that maybe you're kind of more sensitized and that you need kind of a later uh, in life preventative measure. Uh, now, if you're going to do family treatment, of course, you need the buy-in of the parents. And it's, it's a lot harder to uh, get the buy-in of the parents when uh, you're somehow implying that they were at fault or were uh, you know, played an important role in the development of this illness. Uh, there are a few studies that look, have looked at very young kids who don't have any symptoms yet, but are at risk for bipolar disorder and have taught maybe sleep-wake cycle 
management and very little else. Um, so you can do it, but uh, we're always loath to proceed too far without having buy-in from the family uh, because they can yank the kid out of treatment right away. Patty, I had a question for you. Sure. I, I was wondering if uh, you've had any opportunity to look at the extent to which any of the baseline imaging variables uh, were by themselves predictive of outcome, even regardless of treatment assignment. We haven't done that yet. Um, we do know that some of the changes that Patty described, like on the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, did correlate with improvement in depression during that four month period. <clears throat> the drop in amygdala was correlated with the improvement in mania. What we haven't shown is that there's this long-term effect of some sort of neuroimaging variable in preventing recurrence. That's what we'd like to be able to show is that there's prognostic validity. Uh, yeah, I think <laughs> most of our analysis thus far have focused on, um, you know, we certainly have um, analyses that look at baseline characteristics, but I think what's more interesting is, is things that change over time with treatment, you know, that indicating that the brain systems are malleable, right? This is not a static thing that you have amygdala or hyperactivity and that's it, you're, you're screwed <laughs> for life. But that rather that actually with treatment, um, we show that there, that there are changes to this and they do correlate with symptom changes and changes in mood liability, which is really important. Um, so that if those types of behavioral manifestations can be maintained, you may actually get more of a sustained um, uh, period of wellness for the patient. Yeah. In, an interesting, uh, uh, Jim, an interesting side finding, which we haven't gotten dug into deeply yet, is the kids left uh, reports of conflict in the family at the very baseline is predictive of how much drop they see in insular activity over the course of treatment. So if they report a lot of conflict, you see this drop in insular activity, which you think is, is probably about self-awareness. It may be due to maybe about rumination. Uh, so once again, family conflict comes up as a kind of an important moderator. Uh, yeah, and I think what's really important about all this is that it, it's not just the patient's brain, right? So I think oftentimes we're only really studying the patient themselves, but really, studying other factors that are involved in the family environment are really important because environmental factors do play a role on how your brain is responding. Um, particularly if you're a kid and you live in a family, you know. Mm -hmm. um, maybe we have time for one final question, which um, I would, would raise with respect to longer term outcomes. It looks like, um, uh, as you pointed out, as you follow these kids uh, from the trial over time, you achieve a, a really substantial separation um, in prevention of, of uh, episode, but then that seems to fade over time. And I'm, I'm wondering about your, your thoughts or speculations about where the field needs to go with respect to um, more of a maintenance treatment. Yeah. Uh, well, first, I think we need to fully clarify what the predictors are of those different trajectories. In Mark Weintraub's analyses, the, the two best predictors of that, those trajectories were how severely were you depressed to begin with, how suicidal were you at the beginning. That tends to predict a, more, a worse outcome course over time. But from a maintenance point of view, I think if you're seeing a kid following this trajectory of becoming more and more uh, uh, stable, you may want to back off a bit on the medications. Maybe they don't need the complex regimens. Maybe they can get away with a low dose of uh, Lamotrigine or Abilify to get along. Um, or maybe some of them can even be taken off of medications. Well, I really want to thank uh, you both, David and, and Patty, for a fantastic presentation. And it's crystal clear from uh, what you presented why you all represent uh, one of the leading teams in the United States uh, working on pediatric bipolar disorder. So congratulations and, and thanks very much for sharing uh, the, this uh, talk. Thank you for having us. It was a real pleasure. Thanks everybody for listening and your questions. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye.